Blitz is defined as a sudden, savage attack. It is indeed all this. The effect is sure. The premise is simple. It's a basic, primal confrontation, man to man. No excuses are offered. None accepted. Welcome to the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Looks like a radio station. Now, here are your hosts, Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Pure athlete, yeah. I transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk <laughs> man. I back it up. And we are chock full of that, man. Damn right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line. Just stone cold set so. If you're gonna blitz, come strong, but don't come at all. Coming strong because we are in game week. It is time for Texas to get the 2019 season going, and we will break it down on this edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns 24-7. I am Jeff Howe. Let me bring in the rest of the team. He is the master of the soundboard, the drop machine extraordinaire, Matt Butler. How are you, sir? Doing pretty well. Yourself? Rocking that DBU hat from our yes. friends at Last Stand nice Hats. Nice too. Looks nice on you, Matt. Mm-hmm. I got to say thank that. you for free DBU hat. Yeah, laststandhats.com. Mike and everybody over there will take care of you for all your needs. I know yeah. they're planning to be out at tailgates. And actually, Mike's got a really sweet deal. If you get over to Horns 24-7 and go to the flagship message board, uh, Mike has a little contest doing some giveaways on the site. So oh. he'll be doing that. Last day nice. we'll be doing that throughout the season at Horns 24 7. I like so, that. Mm-hmm. Uh, be sure to uh, check that out. Uh, a man who, uh, he's not wearing the last stand hat today, but he does rock the last stand hat whenever oh. he can. Mike, di- time. Mike didn't believe me. He's like, man, Rod loves that DBU hat. I'm telling you, you give Rod a free hat, he will wear it. Yeah, I'm going to wear it all the time. And I like it so much, I actually bought another one, but I don't wear that one because I don't want to wear it out. There you go. That's it. Yeah. Lifetime Longhorn 2002 UT all America 2002 semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe Award, fourth-round draft choice of the New York Giants in 2003. Spent his NFL career with the Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos, and a year with the Hamilton Tiger Cats. In the CFL, when he was done with football, got himself back to Austin, Texas, in the 40 Acres, where he earned his degree. Whenever that T-ring comes in, whenever it's in his possession, I promise I will make sure he wears it proudly. (laughs) Nevertheless, he is a (laughs) card-carrying member of DBU, and when you get that All-American honor recognized by the NCAA, you get that black card. Number 21 in your program, number one in your hearts, Mr. Rod Babers. Thanks for the intro, brother, as as always. As a lifetime Longhorn uh, game week is it always get the I know different times of year it hits you different ways like you know, early August at two a days yeah. like early morning kind of coolish breeze hits you, you and then they start, you get that Jones and yeah, Jones summer and workouts and bowl season but yeah. what is game week like for you as a as a lifetime Longhorn that once wore the burn orange it's still pretty much the same because I still take these deep dives where I'm doing a lot of research on the opponent so I still have. I still can, you know, you watch. Sort of, it's not the same, but it's you not have the a same, tiny but bit it, of you know a little I mean? preparation. I, I can still have a little bit of that, but that's about it now. I'm so far <laughs> removed from it that unless I'm close to the field, and I don't do that very often because I don't like the, I don't like the way it makes me feel to be that close to the game without being able to play it. I'm way too hyped up. I'm sweating. My mm-hmm. heart's beating. I'm all, like, I'm all excited and hyped. I'm ready. Like I definitely could see how. Remember Max' uh, stepson. Yeah. Chris Jesse, who who like grabed that the ball, like the ball. Mm, 2007 <laughs> dude, holiday bowl, the, yeah. the sideline, dude. If you you yeah. really can get like caught up in it, and <laughs> and I, I don't want to be that guy, get caught up in it and do something stupid, so. like Woody Hayes. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. I can see myself really doing something like that. You know what I mean? So I'm like, no, I don't even like to go on the sideline. It's there's there's been a couple games where I because you know reporters are allowed down on the field. Some places it's eight minutes left in the yeah. fourth quarter. Some places it's five. The two, really, there's been three times where I've kind of caught myself. You almost forget you're there for a work function. <laughs> uh, the Notre Dame game in 2016, yeah. being down there, it's oh, like, yeah, wow, this that. is pretty intense. Yep. Uh, the end of the USC game at the Coliseum two years ago. Ooh, uh, and then nice. Charlie Strong's last 2016, the Oklahoma game. Because the Oklahoma game for reporters, it's one of those where you'd never go on the field, right? Like the the way to get into the Cotton Bowl, you've got to go okay. in the press box. Yeah. For fans, last five minutes at home, you're on the field. Yeah, and then the uh, for at the Cotton Bowl, all the interviews are done like on the uh, like the VIP deck area gotcha. of the stadium, so yeah. you never go onto the field. But I did that year. I don't know why I did, but. It's like, and that was like Texas was down big and starts making a comeback. Oh man! And then so I'm standing like in the Oklahoma end yeah. of the field, but it's silent and the Texas end is loud. So it's like you get that. You oh finally, man! I've it's been one thing to, even in the stadium. It's one thing to like watch it from the press box but on the right, field. As you know, it's a totally yeah. different deal when you're it on is. the field. Just, just hearing just that place is weird. You know how the yeah. half the stadium does it. It's on like an echo. And yeah. I think the weirdest, like the weirdest. We'll talk more about this as we get to OU week here in a few weeks, which it's hard to believe that things a few weeks. 
away. But, like, the weirdest experience I've had was the 2010 game. My wife and I went up to Dallas because she just wanted to go to the fair and just kind of want to get away for a weekend. Yeah. And we were outside of the stadium just kind of, you know, eating fair food and watching the game. And you would hear – the eruption in the stadium, and there's the delay on TV, mm-hmm. so you're trying to figure out, okay, which side which, just went nuts, you know? <laughs> and a gambler would love that. Yeah. Yeah. Do some that. Bets. yeah, like, was it an interception, mm-hmm. or was it no, a that's big, Oklahoma big, cheer. Big I know that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, you're right. So, <laughs> no, so it's interesting. True but uh, Now, I mentioned Last Stand Hats, LastStandHats.com. Mike and those guys will take care of you for all your needs. Uh, make sure. And they've, they've got shirts now, the DBU shirts, I yeah, believe, I are those. out. So uh, get over there. Thank you guys so much again for your continued support of the show. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, however you get the show. Thank you so much for your continued support of Longhorn Blitz. Had a weird week last week. I wanted to go heavy Cedric Benson on the the normal edition of the Blitz. So we took recruiting and put it later in the week with myself and Mike Roach. That's why on this week's show, you won't hear Mike. We'll get back to that next week, our normal recording schedule where – it's a one-stop shop. You get the blitz, and it's like an hour and a half of team and recruiting. We just kind of had to split it, uh, and I'm sure everybody understands those have been some unusual circumstances that have no uh, been the reason why we've had to change things up on the recording yeah. schedule, but we will uh, we'll get back to that. Also, don't forget the official Twitter account of the show is at Longhorn Blitz. I made Matt get a different Twitter handle. So, <laughs> Butler uh, and so Austin. he can live his own yeah. social media life. Matt's at <laughs> Butler and Austin. Two. If you want to see Matt's pictures of late night swims at Barton Springs or whatever, <laughs> uh, at Butler and Austin is where you go to get that. And at Longhorn Blitz, we'll be getting more interactive uh, with the Twitter account as we go on. But gentlemen, as I said, game week is upon us. It's here. Rod, you mentioned doing deep dives. Why do I feel like with the way the last two openers have gone, like – I've done an inordinate amount of prep on Louisiana Tech. I have too, like, actually. Way more than I should. Yeah, and I'm actually still doing some more. I'm finding some nice little nuggets and actually starting to watch you know, a little bit more film just to see some of these guys in action. I don't know. Maybe I'm just freaking out. Maybe I'm with you. Maybe I'm paranoid and anxious just because we've lost the last two openers. But I'm thinking that Louisiana Tech isn't as bad as I initially thought they were going to be. They, they do have – more talent than I initially thought, even though last year, obviously, the rankings don't really reflect that. Defensively last year, they weren't bad. Defensively, yeah. they were, uh, you know, I, I would say well above average. Mm-hmm. Offensively, they took a precipitous drop. I yeah, mean, their offensive line last year was not very good. Exactly. But they return a lot on offense, but doesn't matter if it wasn't performing at a really high level anyway. Right. Uh, so we'll get into it. Yeah, we'll get into Louisiana Tech. I want to start with Texas and kind of some of the, the newsy items coming out of Tom Herman's Monday press conference. Texas back on the practice field on Tuesday. He's Tom Herman's expecting Keontae Ingram, Zach Shackelford, pretty much all of the injured guys that have dealt with issues throughout camp to be back full go on Tuesday. Rod, we've spent a ton of time on the show the last few weeks talking about that running back position. Man. We spent a lot of time writing about it at Horns 24-7. Every media member that covers Texas has spent a lot of time talking about running back. Mm -hmm. You really are in a position now, especially with Tom Herman kind of confirming our reports and the reports of others that Roshan Johnson effectively is now your number three tailback. He's your third tailback. Uh, He's not an emergency back. No, he's not an emergency back. He's a third tailback. Emergency back would be somebody behind the third tailback. And just telling he's only using emergency because we only have two guys. Go ahead. But But, you've got Keonta Ingram and Jordan Whittington in green non-contact jerseys. And you know we'd heard that Jordan Whittington had some kind of groin type issue. It just seems like... Rod, I don't know. I've I've had a hernia surgery. I've never had the sports hernia because you can tell by looking at I, me I'm not that athletic. Yeah. But I don't know. Is that something that probably he's just going to need to deal with and maybe get fixed in the off season? Like mm, that's I don't a know. good question because it's it's from high school, right? Yeah. It it's, sounds like for the did way he have it bef- was it a, something that was an injury or was it a pro- procedure done? What, it, what was it, it? My understanding is it was a sports hernia procedure. Okay, so it was a procedure. Okay, there you yeah. go. Uh, I do know that Texas sent him to – because, you know, the guys at Texas that have had sports hernia surgeries, they sent him to the guy in Philadelphia. I don't mm-hmm. know the doctor's name, but he's apparently like what yeah. Dr. James Expert. Andrews is to the ACL, this guy <laughs> is to sports hernias. Hey, man, I want um, the best when it comes to that area. Right, oh. So appara- <laughs> but apparently Jordan Whittington got checked out in Philly, and apparently everything's okay. Okay. So yeah. by, just the way Tom Herman worded it, it sounds like it's just something that he's going to have to kind of manage and just deal with yeah. until maybe until they can go with – season to let everything uh, may, Yeah, win. maybe they go back and look at it in the winter. I don't know. But, Rod, the bottom line is you're down to two tailbacks. 
you guys know me. I'm I'm on that Danny Young train. I'm the conductor of that thing, blowing the whistle. Oh, man, I would and, love to have Danny Young right now. I'd, and, be, I'd be so happy if Danny Young was healthy right now. I'd be on that bandwagon with you. And it's a shame, Rod, because <laughs> a lot of people got behind him with his comments. Texas fans did anyway with his comments about why he didn't transfer and wanted to stick it out and wanted to help Texas yep. win. Yeah. And then he gets what Texas rules a significant high ankle sprain. You're looking at having him and Kirk Johnson out at least probably till the start of weeks. Big 12 play. Yeah. So weeks. you're going to have to get through LSU, Louisiana Tech, LSU, Rice, Oklahoma State, and maybe that bye week before you think about getting – Either, either one of those, either one two of those guys back. back. And then we assume they got to work their way back. It's just going to be – I mean, they're coming off of, you know, severe injuries. So you still got to yeah. work their way back into yeah. shape and all that kind of stuff. Structural so, injuries, not just a hand yeah, injury or Exactly. Something. It yeah. didn't make sure the strength is back there. They're not confident enough to, you know, make moves on it and break Cut. on it and all that kind of stuff. Here's my issue. Here's my issue. Okay. So Rashawn Johnson loved that, by the way. And let me just say this. Tom, Tom Herman, I do think, is trying to – He's trying to look out for his players. And he's, he's, he did the same thing with Gerard Hurd. This is history repeating itself. Yeah. All right? He did the same thing with Gerard Hurd. Spring 2017, he says, oh, no, no, Gerard Hurd is a wide receiver. And everybody goes, well, I think, I think you know, he would, he'd be better served as a third-string quarterback than a wide receiver. Right now, he's like their fifth-best wide receiver. Right. Hey, third-best quarterback right now is more important for Texas because we had just watched Texas since 2011 need at least two quarterbacks every year. And by the way, that has not changed. And Tom I mean, Herman's track record suggests he's going to need at least two to get through the year. Yep. Yeah, he's done – since he's been an offensive coordinator, right, last ten seasons, he's been <laughs> two Had, had to go win a national championship using three. Using three. So – I, you know, we're, you know we're, we're obviously pounding, you know, pounding the pavement about that. And first game of the season, what happens? Shane Bouchel deals with an injury. All right. And then uh, Sam Ellinger ends up starting. Shane's recovering. And then Sam deals with an injury. Mm. And literally, he, he decides, I got to move. I got to move Gerard Hurd back from wide receiver and start practicing that quarterback. And, you know, it's one of those things where, okay, I'm glad you, you know, saw it. But, man, that's something you could have saw. You know, four or five steps ahead. Like, why did? Why it's do we spring need spring ball? You could have seen that, right? I mean, honestly, I, I think you could have studied Texas football for two or three years in the past and go, yeah, yeah, you're gonna need three mm-hmm. legitimate starting quarterbacks. So now you took Rashawn Johnson from the third string quarterback when you have Sam Ellinger, who hasn't made it through an entire football season yet as a Longhorn, and has only made it through one in the last four years. So we all know you're probably gonna need your backup, knocking on some wood. But if you need your backup, you definitely need a third string because yeah. something can happen to the backup. Yeah. So now you got only two scholarship quarterbacks, which is fine. Okay, that's cool. But now you only got two scholarship running backs. <laughs> you put the third string quarterback at running back instead of moving Jake Smith there and then make Rashawn Johnson the fourth string emergency guy, but also still practicing quarterback. You get me? Like, I don't, yeah. I don't understand why. Because this is the same thing he did with Gerard Hurd. He's doing with Jake Smith. Yeah. No, no, no. Got to keep him at He's like, no, you're going to end up moving him there. You're going to end up moving him there, and it's going to take Keontae Ingram going down in the first or the second game, knock on wood, or Jordan Whittington hitting the freshman wall too early for you to do it. And I don't understand why. And I know he's – I got I got. I, I want to be loyal to the players. It's unfair to them. Life is not fair. You, if you're teaching your kids that, you're doing them a disservice. I don't – this is – this is a necessity. Your team needs three running backs. What happens when you get up in a game? Let's assume you get up in a game. You're blowing Louis and Tech out, killing them. Boom. You really want Jordan Whittington and Keontae Ingram taking trash carries? No, let Mason you want, let, do you really want, let you Mason want, Ramirez you want the walk Mellinger? on get some Thank carries. You, you got a walk on hurt now, too. You're one of your walk on running back. You're two of two of your walk on running back. Jer- <gasps> remember Jaron Watkins had the uh had the neck deal. So my thing is, you can't even give it to the walk on running back until you're running out of and bodies. Jer- there. And Jared Smith yeah. an- well, and I- so, <laughs> my point is Jake Smith at third string running back to me would get some of those. I'm going to call them trash carries, but more irrelevant carries. You know what I mean? Late in the game, mop-up duty carries. Because you can't risk Sam, Keontae, or Jordan Whittington getting carries that don't or aren't absolutely necessary now. Agreed fully. Like, if you get to the point that you have garbage time, you shouldn't have Whittington or Ingram on the field. But I also don't think that he necessarily means he will do that. It might just be... It, the situation where he, we're taking to literally his description of what they are, because I agree fully, you need to have a third running back and a third quarterback, and that, depending on the same person, to be one or the other, and now isn't even yeah. training at it, that's, that's really tough. So at that point, it's almost as if you're too overconfident 
in Sam not getting hurt. And that's something that we said on the show that you know that you got to expect to have at least two quarterbacks. But we've learned three and the same thing at running back with three to where hopefully hopefully Texas gets in this situation because it means that they're blowing them out. And then you can exactly. see if maybe a walk-on is inserted because that is an emergency situation. Throw those guys out there. If they're out there running their head against a wall in the fourth quarter and then you have LSU coming, you're really playing with fire at that situation because you're so thin across the board. Where, where you're at right now, Rod, this is such a unique situation that you're really at the Argo level of planning. Like, what's the best bad idea we have exactly. to, to fill out the depth chart? I'll say this about the I Jake Smith thing, though. I think there's enough, and this goes back to something we talked about all offseason, that like Jake Smith is the perfect H receiver that Tom Herman wants in this offense. Agreed. I think there's enough you can do at that H position as weird as it sounds like you can almost take him in that H role and just move work him at running back without him having to learn running back. In other words, he can know enough at H Agreed. to get you through a game. Agreed. So Matt, you, I don't want to put words in your mouth. It sounds kind of like that's what you're saying. That like, let's not hold Tom Herman legitimately strictly to his word. I do think if they need to get Jake Smith some carries, there's a way to doing that without having him learn two positions. Yeah, because he says okay. in case emergency would mean that, like, okay, in actual good and close game situation, you know, these are our only two guys. And if we're talking garbage time, he may actually be the time that you're throwing those guys out there that are somebody that isn't familiar with a position like, say, Smith or a walk-on because, yeah, that'd be playing with fire if you are running just, one of those guys I'm out there. going off what the coach well, said. And that's the main thing right. that no, waiting to no, yeah. what he said. Yeah. He said the same thing about Gerard Hurd, and I disagreed with him. And, and obviously, I think I respect coach, and I think he's really smart so I'm sure he's got knowledge that I don't have well I know he does but to me this is like a problem I, I, I can see like Black Stradamus you can see it coming it's just training camp dude you've had three yeah. running backs go down actually four two walk-ons and then you had two. Kirk Johnson and Daniel Young like the running backs have they made it through a camp dude and you're like oh, we're good with just two two <laughs> you lost four <laughs> I don't get it I don't I don't get it but I, I'm telling you I, I will be very happy if I'm wrong but I'm telling you, like that Gerard Hurd thing, history tells me I'm not going to be wrong. Well, no, I you think gotta, you can be right. Think about the running backs you have now. You got a true sophomore, Keontae Ingram, who hasn't made it through camp without getting nicked up. Yep. And you got a true freshman. You just moved from being an office of savant who's going to hit a freshman wall like every freshman does. Caden Stearns hit it. Sam Mellinger hit it. So what happens when he hits a freshman wall? What happens when that happens? Like, what do you do? You still need a third running back. You still don't need one. You say, oh, Daniel Young's going to come back, and then um, Kirk Johnson will come back. Well, Kirk Johnson ain't really been able to make it on the field right. ever. Yeah. And Daniel Young, you just so you're just gonna hope and pray that Daniel Young makes it. You know what I mean? I, I don't get why you don't have the contingency plan, which is simple. Jake Smith, third string running back, done. Half the time he can practice a wide receiver. Who cares? But he, you need a third running back. You need one. You need one. Yeah. Like it's not. Well, but I, that's I what Roshan Johnson was, is. It's just he's, he's well, way an emergency down guy. Well, no, my, my, he said what he I break glass well, in case true. of emergency. No, I agree. Guy. I heard that. that, too. that yeah, yeah. So I don't want I, let him continue to be that and let him work third string quarterback, which you also are going to need. But yeah. let Jake Smith be your third running back, and then you still got all the options over. Right now, you are limiting options, which I don't understand. What true. I what okay. I would what I would do what I think you know if you look at what a – because like, like I said, right now you're down to what's the best bad idea you have. He has Roshan Johnson Texas. at three Honestly, what I would have done, I would have taken Jordan Pouncey and moved Jordan Pouncey to running back because Jordan Pouncey right now, as you, even if he's your emergency guy, Jordan Pouncey's more valuable as your emergency running back than he is as your number 3H receiver. I, I'm not opposed to that. I'm just saying more. It seems like he it seems like he's limiting options when you should just be giving yourself more options. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Agreed. I I agree with you. He Rob. may just feel also that Roshan is better fit than those guys for this week at that spot, Could but be. also at quarterback for this week at that Could spot. Be. Well, I hope it's I hope it's a much ado about nothing. Yeah. And, and it could, I mean, look. Or it could derail the entire effing <laughs> season. Okay. So, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, okay. yep. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. my point is, okay. Yeah. You, mean, you understand that? No, he's that? gambling. Like, it, and he's gambling it's a, that it's a gamble. Sam so gets you, healthy. Is healthy. And that's, because a, that's then a hell of a gamble. True. That's a hell of a gamble to take when you know against LSU you're going to have to run them 25 times. Yep. Yeah. Because against Georgia, you took him 21 times. Against Oklahoma, the first time, took him 19 times. You're going to have to go need Bam Bam Sam to run it. And we know in the big games, you're going to release Bam Bam Sam or unleash him. So, in the other games, when you don't want to expose Bam Bam Sam, who needs to carry the running game? The running backs. Right now, right. they're dropping like flies. Yep. That's my point. So I, 
I hope I'm wrong and I hope it, I'm no, making no, I think we're all on the same page really. about nothing. Even he said it was like a high alert situation and still it's like, well, it didn't seem like we we're addressing it as a high alert situation. It seems like it's like it's high alert. Let's hope and pray. Like, okay. Six. Uh in theory, so. you could maybe get Kirk Johnson back by the Oklahoma State game. Maybe the Rice game. Man, theories Steve, and hopes and dreams that, and prayers. I'm just looking at the calendar and counting weeks and figuring out like when he can return. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, like, why, I don't Daniel wanna, if I am a coach, I, you have to assume the worst is going to happen. Yeah. You have to plan on it. That's your job. Your job is to plan for the worst and assume it's going to happen. Can you plan on losing four running backs in one camp? You need to. <laughs> well, now they're dropping like flies. So why now are you going to go on the faith that they're going to get Gus going to get healthy and that everything is going to be okay and everybody's going to end up rounding in the form when the season hasn't even started? They haven't even started taking punishment yet. Yeah, true. You know what I mean? like, but yeah. still, this also, is our guys hitting them. So imagine what yeah, happens when no, the other team starts hitting. I, I don't. I I, I, I hear you, right? I, am, I don't know. I, I hear don't, you. I, don't, I just I, I watched it happen to in the Gerardo series. I remember yelling the same exact. Go yeah. get the damn podcast from exactly this time in 2017 when he came, and I had the same rant. And I said, I'm telling you, it's going to come to pass. All right, You're, the lack of vision is going to hurt him, and it hurt him. And I don't know. I just okay. have the case. All okay. you have to do right now is just hope that doesn't come to pass and you need to go okay. beyond the two healthy well, running backs you have. You can do more than hope, though. You can make I mean, to be fair, I really think he's just sitting there looking at Roshan Johnson's best fit to be okay. the third quarterback and third running back. And as we both said, and I'd say agree, that you'd have to have an injury, a big one, to Sam and to another running back to have that become an issue, which – is could happen. Nobody, no, I mean, <laughs> but I point. don't think anybody I, thinks that can't point. happen. I know. So, I in so that my, situation, so I think he's actually, the third could, quarterback. Some people argue it's likely to happen considering the history of Sam one, here I and what has happened that. at running back. You could argue, I'm saying you could argue that. Oh, yeah. So, in that point, in that world, why not address it before it happens? Okay, you, let's move I, on. But, but no, he's no, 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 I'll say this like in the transfer running back, the grad transfer running back questions popped up on the message board. And my thing was this, like, the only decent option you had was Tavian Feature. Like, the running back grad transfer market was not good. Like, we even talked about it, right? Like, we went through names in the portal this spring, and we decided, like, hey, you're almost better seeing if you convince, can convince Kyle Porter to come back than going to get something in the portal because that's probably the better option than what's out there. I totally understand. And, and your that was best, before your running backs got hurt. Your best option was Tavian Feaster, but if Tavian Feaster wasn't going to be able to join your program until camp, like no off season, no nothing, just throwing them in there in camp. Like maybe that comes down to a culture decision to not push for that. I don't I know. It's just I Thank I God agree with you team. that there is a certain level of this that as a coach you have to be prepared for all scenarios. I totally agree with you on that. I just think this is such a unique situation that it's like, man, like plan when plan B is like you're down to plan like H or something <laughs> at this point. I don't even know where you are. In the alphabet, but it's not good. It's not a good place to be. No, I'm not saying it's anybody's fault. I'm just saying I think there's more that could be done. And I, I'm just saying I gave a historic example. He's only right. been there two years of a situation exactly like this. And, I'm, and I brought up, I and brought I think up, that I don't know if he learned from that. That's my point. He I may learned, not have. and I don't think he learned from it. No, I brought, I brought up the pouncy thing. Uh, you, maybe you're deep enough at at safety to where maybe you could look at Montrell Estelle on on offense. I don't know. I mean, look. Here, here's here's the here's the thing though. The, let's spitball this for a second. Let's say you get worst case scenario right, and you need to switch it up to go into LSU or whatever. You need some extended time. By worst case scenario, you mean a running Sam's back out getting hurt. I'm not, not, not going to say it. We because I'm not going to say it because I'm not going to be held responsible. But just if something so we know happens. what we're talking about. I don't want people to go back and pull audio. One yes, yes, we're out. talking about like like a, a situation Ingram's as Rod out. said that could completely derail your season. Yeah. If that happens at running back, Rod, I think your best option at that point, if it's for prolonged, I think you've really got to figure out, okay, can Josh Thompson play nickel, and do you look at moving B.J. Foster to running back? <laughs> you could. Like, that's the kind of – That's uh, the kind of crazy the, stuff. To me, they, that's the next like level scenario you you're to talking be. about. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. No, 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 I, I totally agree. But, you know, like I said, right now you have a guy that played running back who was a prodigy, Gatorade player of the year, who could probably just jump in there and – I said, I'll, I'll that's trust. all I'm saying. So it's all. I don't even know why that. Why would you do something more drastic than just doing that, which doesn't seem that drastic? I would. <laughs> that seems like 
more, the more, and we more may no still brainer. see that. The other stuff you're talking about is like, oh, we're holy hell. Let's what's the what's the craziest thing we can think of? Get wacky. Let's give me some wacky ideas, guys. It's like, no, let's just take the guy who was a Gatorade National Player of the Year as a running back slash wide receiver and just move him to running back full time. I agree. Why and if he's win? on the field, I really that think though he. Yeah, a, I don't think it's I, eliminated from the options no, I know, either. No, no, no. So I, I, I think, think he could easily. We're not do that. arguing and disagreeing. I'm just though. Right. I'm, just, I'm just pushing the point. Like I don't. That seems more of a rational move than the moves that is being any other I, move being suggested. I think Jake. Even the Rashawn Johnson. I'm saying it's Whittington. more rational than the Rashawn Johnson move. But that's right. outside it's the box. It's a more one rational move. My must, point is, why get outside the box when right now the you can still be in the box and be good? I think there's enough. <laughs> I, think I think there's I enough. Think Rashawn might have proved himself that he no, fits for I, the No, I think there's too. enough. That, like I said, there's enough you could do with that each position to supplement some of the carries from yeah, the running no, backs. No, no. So, and okay. and keep in mind. I mean, I mean Jake, Jake Smith, we know, had at least one scrimmage where he got extensive work yeah, at running back. Got a, got a I think I think Rod, if a push came to shove and they wanted to do it, like Jake Smith knows like two or three plays where he could go in there and like get you through a game or take some of those, you know, if carries you late in the game if yeah. you need him to. Mm-hmm. So, and but then the way that Whittington thing, started though. in a role like that, but now is just like you know he's a running back. What this he's is doing, where you get it. Multifaceted skill sets across the offense. We've talked about it all year. That's the type of thing that really has helped Texas because we have guys that can do things at multiple positions. This is where you get in like moving chess pieces and deciding, okay, who's valuable and where are they valuable. Mm-hmm. Clearly, they value Jake Smith in the return game. Because as a true freshman, game one, yeah. he's your starting punt returner, and he's one of your two primary kickoff return guys. Because he's an explosive player. Right. Yeah. I just want to get him as many opportunities On the field. So, to, to have the ball in his hands, which also can happen at running. We'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> no, I I, yeah. I I see. I totally see where you're coming from, Rod. Like you said, we're not disagreeing. It's just you're... You're you're at that you're at that Argo level. Or okay, what's the what's the no, best no. bad idea? We and it's got nobody's right? fault. I don't wanna, I'm not pointing fingers. Well, and I don't think there are many yeah. bad ideas. I think these are all pretty decent ones that they're having. To I don't deal know, with Matt. Out of like, chaos. In, well, I mean, in we, years but like past, said, in years forced. past, we'd be raking coaches over the coals for moving a third string quarterback to tailback. I maybe everybody has their own opinions because I <laughs> nah. wouldn't. Well, <laughs> those guys know what they're doing pretty well. If no, no, there like, I'm not. So I'm not criticizing yeah. that move or the evaluation. I'm just saying I think there's another move that. No, it's would help that's what we're here to do. Yeah. So before we get into Louisiana Tech, I want to talk some. So we covered the injuries right there. Um, you know, I don't think there's anything maybe other than the Brennan Eagles and Demarvion Overshone situations. Um, it sounds like they might need maybe a little more time to determine if those guys are going to be ready. Other than that. Oh, Sounds, is that why John Burt is I like, yeah Z because of the well it, was it an elbow you've got the Brennan Eagles season? getting the elbow cleaned up you've yeah. also got the Josh Moore suspension which Josh Moore suspended yes. for at least the Louisiana Tech game and Tom Herman said they're going to wait to see how the legal process plays out but I think his next hearing is like from last I checked it was like September twenty second. Okay. Or September twenty third, something yeah. like that. So He's you're through the three, Oklahoma State say, game yeah, at that like, point. Yeah, you're three weeks in. So I guess the twenty second would be a Sunday, so you're not having court case on Sunday. So it's like the twenty third, I guess. Yeah. But at any rate, so maybe you're looking at like the Monday before your bye week where maybe you get some resolution. Maybe something happens before then. I don't know. But yeah, I think that's a bit and John Burt, you know, I haven't heard about John Burt to me at this point, Rod, it's kinda like I look at Denzel Okafer. Like we've heard about both those guys in the past having just bad practices. Yeah. Now, I'm not hearing about either one of them having great practices, but I haven't heard about any of them, either one of them having bad practices. Well, they're all, I mean, Burt's a senior and Okafor's a, a fourth year junior. Yeah. So, so, yeah, you get to the point now, like your baseline, you're supposed to be at the point where at least you're not having bad, disastrous practices. Maybe you're not practicing like an All American every day. But right. you're not having bad practice. You're more it, consistent. And it could be a deal where, like you said, with Eagles being out, more being suspended. You know, John Burt came back as a fifth-year senior when he didn't have to. He could have he could have bailed and you know grad transferred and done something else. This is to me is kind of a reward to say, hey, thanks for sticking it out. Thanks for working hard. You've earned the right to start in the opener. Yeah, um, yeah. No, that's, that's interesting. I I think you uh, make a good point there about John Burt. He has been. I don't think he's complained about anything. I mean, he's not been, to my knowledge. Not to my it. knowledge. Yeah, he's been a team. If he had, I think coach, I think coach Herman would have uh, sanctioned him somehow. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, we've set fits the position. Like he got to be fast. He won't speed. Be a vertical well, we've threat. We've, speed. we've seen guys that Tom Herman's had some issues with yeah. earlier in his tenure that ended up lower on the depth chart. Exactly. Like, Even when he had like, issues, why is it so and so play? Well, we read the tea leaves. Well, Colin Johnson, remember, he had uh-huh. an issue with the way Colin was practicing for a while. They were like, why is Colin not getting more playing time? Which I now seems ridiculous. 
still. Well, and, and he was trying to, but trying like to Chris, Chris Warren, Chris Warren's a good example. Chris right? Warren is a good example. Like, why yeah. aren't you giving him carries? Why are you moving to the tight end? Well, you go fast forward to this offseason, and the Raiders say, hey, we want you at 250 coming into camp, and he reports at 270. And it's like, yeah, you're talented, but we asked you to do one thing. You had 270 last well, week, just gain 25 more pounds and heard, yeah. tackle. I heard that's Chris what – And that honestly, like, real good money. I heard that's exactly what John Gruden and Mike Mayock told him. You guys know my feelings about Gruden, but that's exactly what they told him. Yeah, like, we, we asked you to do one thing. One thing. One man. thing, and you couldn't do it. Yeah, I agree. Good so, point. you know. Um, but yeah, no, no, no. I that's, said, that's John, neither here nor there at the end of the day. But, but uh, I, John Burt, I was interested about that one, and you pretty much uh, summed that one up pretty well. Oh, and also the cornerback spot. Opposite Let's Jaylen dive Green, into that, Rod, because we, this this kind of confirms what we'd been hearing through Deshaun camp, James. that Jalen Green really separated himself in that battle. Yeah, and he's, he's and Tom Herman even said in the press conference, Jalen Green's earned the right to call himself a starter. Yeah. As for the other three guys, take Anthony Cook out, because we know Anthony Cook can't start the Louisiana Tech game. Yeah. So, boom, he's done, non-factor. You've got Kobe Boyce or Deshaun Jameson. And, Rod, this is kind of playing out like I, when people have asked me about corner, this is kind of how I said it. What I figured push comes to shove. If they're not 100% certain, I think as a coach and an opener, you tend yeah. to at least lean with a guy no, that's got right. game experience. Yeah. So Kobe Boyce is going to take the first snap. Man, hell, after that, all bets are off. I don't know how this thing's going to play out. I, I really like Deshaun Jamison in there. I know you like Anthony Cook. A lot of people like Anthony Cook. But just because Kobe Boyce is going to start the opener, and that's the way it's trending, and I think that's what ultimately is going to happen unless something crazy at practice happens, happens at practice if I can talk right today. Mm-hmm. I, I, all bets are off after that. No, you called it, and I and I agree with you. I think once they put the guys out there and we see how, the, how Louisiana Tech is going to attack that other corner, and they will. Trust me, they, they've they been reading reports, too. they got people keeping up with it, and they know the corner. If you're going to attack one, don't go after Jalen Green. Go after the other guy. And um, so I figure they're going to go after that corner early and often. So you'll, you'll know pretty early if Kobe Boyce is going to struggle or if he's having confidence issues or if he's you – know, I think last year he just played passive. You know, he wasn't very aggressive. You know, corner's one of those things. you got to believe what you see. you got to believe your technique, believe your film study, and just let it fly. And I think a lot of times he was hesitant. You know what I mean? It's, and that's what they love about Deshaun James. Yeah. He's not. He's the opposite, right? right. Deshaun James is the opposite. Sometimes he, he believes too much. He's overconfident. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, oh, I saw this. Like, no, you didn't. That was actually a <laughs> hitch. He's himself. a return man. He has that mentality. Yeah. Just but I think the coaches confidence. would rather have that at a corner than yeah. the guy who's just passive and always playing on his heels, and you can just keep on coming out and completing those there. curl routes and then just death by a thousand cuts. Right. They'd rather have a guy Deshaun James. Oh, you may get him three or four times. But oh, you better watch. There's it. no that, hesitation. He's, he's coming for it. So well, I want to ask you styles. about that because Kobe Boyce is an interesting study. Because like last year, Devontae Davis got hurt early mm-hmm. in that Maryland game, and Kobe Boyce came in and I thought played pretty well. Yeah, but then go. But to then the, the next Oklahoma, week, like he, yeah. the the week, the Tulsa game and the Oklahoma State game, where yeah. he's in a starting role, he's starting role. Have in your experience as a player, like, can you tell that when a guy just has to come in and mm-hmm. there's really no expectation? And he just kind of he's playing free and loose and playing well, yeah. mm-hmm. but it's almost like dropping a baby you, in water. You almost and, and pardon my you know vernacular yeah, here, but I'm it's almost you. like you mind f yourself. Yeah, yeah. When you're put into a starting position, and it's like, what happened to that guy I saw last week that was playing loose and free, and now it's like you're just you're not cutting it loose. You're just kind of almost timid out and you, there. And you just said it right. They put him in, and he's not expecting it, so. He's playing free. He's playing loose. He's playing on instincts at that point. He's playing on instincts. Yeah, exactly right. And then after he has a week to prepare, Mm. as you point out, he almost, you know, sorts to d- kind of distort things a little bit. He, System overload. I don't know, whatever it is. He, I mean, Sean McVay talked about this in the Super Bowl. He said he uh, he watched too much film. Mm-hmm. He said he overprepared, actually. He said he wasn't using enough of his natural instinct and skill as a play caller. And I think for some guys, maybe like Kobe Boyce, I know you can tell he plays tight when he's starting, which he doesn't make sense. You know he's getting all the starting reps in practice that week. You know that he's probably uh, doing way more film study than he does. He was playing in a reserve role, uh, but for some reason he plays tight, and the coaches notice that. And at corner, man, you can't have that. No. I've heard you people talk about it before yeah. called oversaturation, and yeah. there, there's amount the brain can really – like it's pointless to just work yourself to death. If you just work over and over and over, say you're preparing, it's a big game, and there's a point where you – 
your brain doesn't even absorb all of the information that you're taking in. So you can be oversaturated or you can overanalyze or you can feel a situation yeah. and almost become overprepared because you know that you want to do a good job. But then just hearing you explain that just reminded me of hearing Chris Sims talk about games at Texas at times yeah, in his Sims life and his lot. career was that type of personality. Yeah. And I literally have a neurotic like personality where you can get yourself so prepared for the future that like you can't even go to sleep like your mind's always thinking about but then it puts you in a pressure situation you don't get the rest that you expect and then and, you don't absorb what you and, think and you don't work as well and, and let me let me specify I, I i don't think you can traditionally like over prepare but i do think if early on things don't go as you plan when you really prepare yeah. you you were like oh it's gonna everything's gonna play out like this this is how it's gonna happen yeah all right and when it doesn't then you chris, start I like chris sims your stuff. yes right i like kobe boys like oh man Early on, I'm struggling a little bit. You want guys that are going to be able to bounce back. Yeah. And that's why he liked Deshaun James. Yes. He bounces back. He then like, you get stuck he, in he your head after that. And then you get stuck. And then you start replaying everything you prepared for and why it's not working. And, and then during you're the game, that's and... the wrong time to do that. It's not just time to play. Screw everything. Mm -hmm. if, if the game plan that you initially came up with, I can tell you how many times I've been on sidelines where the coach balls up the game plan and go, all right, guys. We're just going to play man-to-man. Yep. Man. Uh, we're going to do this. It's like, all right, I guess we're just going back to so playing football because everybody was to a wrong. Chick and you have it planned yeah. out right in your mouth, and then you say the dumbest thing. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly <laughs> right. It's like, it's like a date you've been uh, you've been thinking it's about like for two and months, and you say something and stupid. Make so I think guys just struggle early on when it doesn't go according to plan. I think Kobe Boyce is in that. When he went out there and he had no plan, it's the best I said, go back and Go back and watch his game yeah. film against Maryland. Like, I agree I, with you. I thought he played well in yeah, that game. I agree with you on that. And that's when everybody on defense wasn't playing that great. Right. Yeah. You can you can count the number of guys on one hand that played well against Maryland, and as it turns out, early on, like Caden Stearns and B.J. Foster were two of those guys. But obviously, in practice, well in they're game. seeing something they like. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm hoping in practice they're attacking those guys, and then you're seeing them. Oh yeah, I mean Todd Orlando said that when yeah. I talked to him at the coaching convention. He talked about it in his press conference, and we talked about it, you know, one on one a little bit. Like, and he said it several times. He said, "I can't." His take was basically like, I can't trust the guy to start if I haven't watched him go against Colin Johnson a lot. Exactly. And I need Colin Johnson to beat you, and I need you to come back, and I need you, I need him to keep attacking you, and I need you to want, at one point to go cuss out the guy with the script and go cuss out the OC and tell him to quit effing with you because I, you ain't the one. And when you get that kind yeah. of mentality. Can I, can and I interject the, on I that real quick? Doing yeah. it like, hey, y'all keep throwing it over here. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm a, just practice up. I'm telling you. And, then, and I'd get a pick, and then I would go dance and do everything. And I'd mm -hmm. practice. I'd quit throwing over here. There's but a, you yeah. got you got to have that type of dog in you. And they're looking for that dog. That's why they like Deshaun James. He's got that dog. Yeah. There, the, none, if Anthony Cook's got that, it's like he did have it when he came in, and now he's lost some of his swagger. But we we talked about it with him, though. We talked about it with him, Rod. The challenge for him, it sounds like, knowing he was suspended and he's not going to start, it almost seems like, hey, why, instead of like the perception that this has been handed to you, why don't yep. you try to Go earn it. fight some adversity and work your way, but work your way up. Because you got and that I don't know the And then place. you learn something about him. Yeah. When you put him in that position, you went, oh. He didn't battle adversity very well. He folded maybe in in some situations in that with that adversity, and maybe there's waiting on him now to get his confidence back and his swagger back. Because I think the opposite, yeah. like we just talked about when we how we just laid it out, I think the opposite is true of Kobe Boyce. Like, hey, no, we're we're gonna trust you to be a starter. Just go out there and play loose. Stop thinking so yeah, much and just go play. Power. Like, we're, we're you're good. Or, you're good yeah. enough to start here. I agree with you, Matt. Yeah, some guys you got to empower, and mm -hmm. some guys you know they need like a kick in the rear. Yeah, you gotta mm -hmm. motivate them. Right. And Jason, like Jason Washington you get both in both doing, ways. You know? Like yeah. if a guy like Cook was a guy that was confident, but then this situation, knowing he wasn't gonna start, and then them being like, oh well, let's just see if he battles back. And like some guys, it it may take some time to mentally he should be there because he That's got there in the first place just working hard. Yet then now you're reset and you aren't getting back to that mentally. Part where you were confident. It, it, yeah, yeah attacked. That's why it's going to be interesting because early on, they'll get it. That Kobe Boyce and Deshaun Jameson will be attacked. And then that second half, de basically depending on how they've done, yeah. you'll, see a, you'll see a move by the coaches if they think Anthony Cook can make a better play or it's, can it, be a better it's player. It's funny when we talk about this process, and I'll, I'll just share a quick personal story, you know, because my playing, playing experience at, at football is only at the high school level. You know, they got that old saying, like, you don't lose your job due to injury. Bull crap because I lost a starting job <laughs> yeah. due to injury, yeah, and, and, to and, and, and years Romo. later, you know, right. my <laughs> offensive so. my offensive line coach uh, oh, Clint, Hutt, Clint Hudson's mm -hmm. become like a father figure to me, and we've talked about it later. I'm like, I'm like, I was like, I thought starters didn't lose their job. And he's like, I, was like, I lost one. He's like, we needed to see you fight from back up underneath to to go get that job again. That's great, yeah, because like, the guy we put there was playing well. We're not just going to put you back in that spot. You need to go earn it again. Go earn mm -hmm. it. So that's what happens. But it's something interesting you said, Rod, though, about pushing guys. 
I, and as a Cowboys fan, I've watched this. I, I don't know how many Cowboys fans are listening to this podcast or just football. But if you're yeah. a football <laughs> fan in general, I suggest you go watch it. There's a, there's Probably an hour long, audience. about an hour long documentary on Bill Parcells' tenure with the Cowboys, and it's looking mm. at his first training camp and kind of how he was on Larry Allen and button heads with Larry Allen, mm. and they're showing a, a portion <laughs> of one on ones where Larry Allen loses loses a, a battle to Leroy Glover, and he kind of kicks his helmet and like is just pouting about it, yeah. and you know. Parcells like you need to set an example for the young guys. Like you know, why are you back here pouting? And Larry Allen's like, well, I got beaten. Uh, you know, excuse my language, what Parcells said in the documentary. He's like, hey, you need to get your ass kicked sometimes. Hmm. He's like, and at your age, it's going to happen. Yeah. He's like, but how you handle that, I want to see you respond to that. I don't, I don't want you sitting here just pouting. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And the coaches want to see it. And, and the coaches, they do. They want to see you battle through some adversity. I, I mean, <laughs> and the funny thing was, they cut to the next rep and like Larry Allen dominates. Cake somebody. <laughs> Larry Allen dominates Leroy Glover. Which Leroy Glover's all pro defensive yeah, tackle. Yeah. Dominates Leroy Glover, and then it cuts to Parcells like, oh, Larry, I'm gonna be on you. You're gonna hate me, but. Time we're done with this thing. If, I, if I, that's what it takes to bring out the best in you, then I'm going to be on you all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what a good coach does. So, and Parcells is yeah. one of the one of the best ever. God, love me some Parcells stories, man. And then you look at that coaching tree. Belichick's on that coaching tree, and then the two Bills. They barely uh, Saban bad. splits off <laughs> right. from that. That was the name of their thirty yeah. for thirty, right? That was a great thirty yeah. for thirty. Anyway, I still need to watch that. Dude, you got to watch that too. Yeah. Yeah. Only because like it's awesome. really odd to see Belichick in a light where. He's around a guy like Bill where, like, there's that admiration quality. And he yeah. sort of – you see a tiny bit of personality while Bill B- Parcells is, like, the gruffier, older guy, like, not trying to embrace the, It's just odd oh, to it see because that's weird. what Belichick always is until he's around Parcells and then he seems as if he's some effusive, emotional man compared to Parcells. Yeah. No, I agree with you on that. It's absurd. Yeah. So – Let's get back to Texas, and I want to do some season prediction type stuff as we start Ooh. to kind of head down the stretch here before we get into Louisiana Tech prep All right. uh, and talking about the Bulldogs. Rod, just from a big picture standpoint, I've been asked for like season predictions, and I was on uh, with on CBS Austin with Jeff Barker doing their Sunday sports show, and I knew they were going to ask predictions, so I really started to think about it. Like, you know, we usually do the schedule game here, but there's just time didn't allow for it this year, but. Um, I started thinking, okay, like, what what do I really think? Like, and I'm trying to think of, like, what the ceiling is for this team. Where's the floor and where's the ceiling? Like, where do you set the bar? Mm -hmm. And to me, where I set the bar, and I've said this, you know, going back to spring ball, the bar for me is get back to the Big 12 championship game, Mm -hmm. which if you do that, you're at nine or 10 regular season wins, and you've got a chance to go win you a conference championship. Like, get back to Arlington. That anything less than that, if Texas does less than that, then it was a disappointing season. If they don't at least get back to the Big 12 championship game. In terms of beyond that, I still think this roster is a year away from where you can really look at it and say, yes, there's no question in my mind they are a college football playoff contender. I totally I'm not saying they can't get there this year, yep. but I think it's a year away before you can say, okay, like if the game, if the Texas LSU game were in Baton Rouge this year, there's no way I'm picking Texas to win that game. But the game next year. I'll think about it because looking at how different LSU's roster is going to be yeah. from what they could lose and how different the Texas roster is going to be from some of these younger guys getting to grow up a year, that I give Texas a much better chance to win that game next year. Yeah. Aligned well for Texas in both cases. So thinking about it, Rod, we'll just go just kind of some season predictions mm-hmm. from here. I think Texas goes 10-2 and in the regular season. I think they lose the LSU game, given, given what I just said. I think they lose the LSU game because – my reason for picking LSU is I don't think Texas, I don't know if they're going to be ready to play with the kind of mass all, all in the defensive front, linebackers and linemen, that early in the season play with the kind of mass they're going to need to go mash with LSU for four quarters. Okay. I don't know if that, that that part of the defense is going to be ready for that type of challenge that early. Yeah, I think one of those road games, whether TCU gets quarterback figured out, whether Iowa State figures out how to replace David Montgomery, Hakeem Butler, or – Baylor makes that upward trend that me and some other folks think at some point they're going to really make under Matt Rule. And I think, you know, the penultimate game of the regular season is probably a time where they're, if they're going to hit, make that trend upward, that's probably the time they're doing it. Yeah. I think one of those three road games is a loss. So I think Texas is 10 and 2. They beat Oklahoma in the regular season, get back to the Big 12 championship game, mm. beat Oklahoma in the Big 12 championship Hard to beat game. beat them twice. Miss out on the playoff, but in my crazy scenario, I think you get a chance to avenge the early season loss. You get LSU again in the Sugar Bowl, mm-hmm. and you beat LSU in the Sugar Bowl to finish twelve and two with a Big Twelve that championship would, that and would a Sugar be really Bowl. Sexy win. If that happens, that'd be really. That sexy. to me is the ceiling of this team. 
Um, Sugar Bowl, but not New Orleans. Two loss regular season, win so the Big your 12 title. Ce- is your ceiling? My ceiling okay. is like 12-2. and two. Win the Big 12 championship, okay. miss out on the playoff, but go to the Sugar Bowl and win the Sugar Bowl for the second year in a row. Okay. Um, see, the thing about, and I, I agree with you, I think 2020 a lot of people had picked when Tom Herman first came in as that being the year uh, that Texas, he can build the roster with his own recruits, should have the quarterback in place, all that kind of stuff. But they were they were ahead of schedule. That's the thing that mixes Longhorn fans up. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. They weren't supposed to be able to beat Georgia last year. They weren't supposed to be able to do that. They, like, weren't, that, they weren't supposed to be able to beat Oklahoma. To Matt's point, they weren't like supposed to be able to beat Oklahoma. Season, yeah, no, 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 good point. Uh, yeah, nobody really expected that. So, I, so they are ahead of schedule in a lot of ways, but I agree. Us arguing over the running back position tells you in itself they're still not deep enough to be – national championship caliber, you know what I mean, in terms of the overall roster yeah. and, and the talented depth, as you call it. So I do I do understand that. I totally agree with you. Um, I got them, man, I think right now I'll take them regular season. I had them at 11 wins, but now I'm looking at the depth. I guess the closer I get to the season, the more realistic I, my view may get, less optimistic. Mm-hmm. And I think now I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm looking at 10 and 2 because I know that's going to be a lot. I figure they'll lose at least to either LSU or <laughs> Oklahoma, and they'll play Oklahoma twice because I think I'm going to the Big 12 title. I don't know which one of those three they're going. I know they're going to lose one of those, like what? one of those three, LSU or two Oklahoma games, right? They're, right. They're, there's no way they're going to go. They're going to if they do that, they're going undefeated. You yeah. know what I mean? I like, got they're that good, and I don't know if they're that good. That was kind yet. of my thing about one of those road games. Like right? if you win all three of those road games, you're you're right in the mix for the playoff. Yeah. And with you saying two loss, you're saying eleven and two at this point because you're counting the the Big Twelve championship. And so I'm kind game. of making my way through it. So yeah, yeah. in regular season, I'm intending to going to the you know going to the Big Twelve title game. But then I said I don't know if I got them winning it or not yet because yeah. I don't know which one of those games they're going to win. And I agree with you. Tom Herman has a a Tom Herman type loss against a team that everybody expects him to beat. All right, um, and we, I mean, you can go through Tom Herman Man, senior year of age. Oklahoma here. State. The, the more you know, I look at Oak the State, schedule, Oak State. Hell, that game. You can come State out of nowhere. Iowa me. State. Can Iowa scare State's you. the Baylor scariest can scare one. you. I could see four. I could see four teams pulling an upset in the Big Twelve Conference over Texas, and see, I wouldn't be shocked. See, here's my argument you know against I mean? Iowa State. Man, I'd be shocked if Kansas or K State did it. My only case Tech is, too. I mean, it's late in the year on the road right. against a good team. That's just, right. That's the simplistic yeah. nature. My my, where I think if you're a Texas fan, you can feel good about Iowa State. Those three years, Tom Herman spent. In Ames, he's been a part of some of those Paul Rhodes staffs that like won the game. The game that people like, oh, Iowa State beat somebody they had no business beating. Yeah, Tom Herman was a part of those staffs, so he understands what the environment that scenario. Tom Herman understands what that's all about. Number one, number two, he understands going against the Matt Campbell football team, and yeah. this is again why you can like their chance against Baylor. Like Tom Herman knows going against the Matt Campbell coach team and Matt, Matt Rule coach team, yeah. the type of physicality you're going to need to have to win that game. Agreed. And Texas can match that physicality. <clears throat> where, where the the two games that worry me though, if TCU figures out what they're doing at quarterback, and, now, and by that point in the season, yeah. they've either figured out what they're doing at quarterback or it's just gone off the rails for Gary Patterson. Then again. I mean, last year, a year where he loses to Kansas and all those injuries, they still managed to go win a bowl game. So you figure they're they're usually overachieved from where whatever you think TCU is going to do. And now that Art Bryles isn't on the schedule anymore, like this is really is the one game Gary Patterson wants to win. Like I really think Gary Patterson, not that he would be happy, but I think he would crack a smile if you oh, could yeah. tell him you go one and eleven, but that one's over Texas. Mm-hmm. He'll find his way to hang. He'll find a way to hang his hat on that. Same with Matt Rule. And, 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 and I think thing too. Yeah. And again, the Baylor. reason why the, the, those two games. TCU and Oklahoma State because Mike Gundy's won the last five times he's been to Austin. He's won, I think, seven of the last nine Are or whatever it is. So the two most tenured coaches in the Big 12? I think that's the two best coaches in the league. Well, like, take Tom Herman two, out yeah, of the equation. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think those are the two best coaches in the saying. Big 12. Yeah, so in, right terms now, of, in terms of if you say which coach for one game can, can come out, up with a – Out-coach you and out-scheme Out-coach you? Tom Herman, out-scheme Todd Orlando, come up with the perfect plan to beat Texas, I think it's Gundy and Patterson. I Luckily, Texas that. favored by 11 over Gundy early on for the games of the year. That ain't good. 11's good, though. 11 huh? double-digit favorites at least good. Well, well, I know, but I'm just saying as an underdog, I don't know. I, I, I think just give give uh, gives uh, Jeff's point a little bit more credibility. Like, yeah, that's all he needs. He needs to he needs to be counted out. I mean, yeah. he's a damn good coach. Oh, you right. always Herman, have a good product. And you know Herman what I mean? as a favorite is as not I said, very exactly, good. Knows, especially double digit favorite. He doesn't he doesn't cover that often. Yeah, as a I mean, when you favorite. look at Herman, yeah. this is going back to 2015 with Houston, but he's 10 one and one as a dog against the spread. But as a favorite, you're still under 500. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. at Texas. As a favorite against the spread, I believe he's two and seven when favored by a touchdown or more with three outright losses. That's yeah, what I'm saying. Like, I don't overall. like that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't really like that. Yeah, you know I mean, 
But anyway. No, but that that's the trend that's got to change with but that. But I'm with you on that. That's why I, I think I I think I'll take him another loss, one of those teams, and I'll go eleven and two. With I still got to win the Big Twelve though. I think they're I think they're better. I, I do. They got to win in the Big Twelve championship. I, they're a better overall football team than Oklahoma. They are. I agree. Oklahoma's just got Lincoln Riley and and you know, Alex, Jaden Hurts. Alex you know. Grinch will make them better in the front defensively. In that offense, and they, yeah. they've got good players in that front with Mark Jackson, Ronnie Gallimore. Perkins. Yeah, Gallimer. They've got guys. I think you'll see the best of some of those guys. But Rod, that doesn't change the fact that man, your secondary talent is. Yeah, and you not lost Norwood too for the year. Yeah. Who's going to be your starting nickel? Yeah. yeah, they're going. They're going. They're going to struggle a little bit, but I think they'll be a little bit better. The offense may not be as prolific, but man, it's Lincoln Riley. I mean, I trust that brand, so yeah. they'll be good. They'll, he'll 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 have the best of Jalen Hurts, and that's his best. That's as good as you can hope for. Preliminary line: Texas is a four point dog to Oklahoma. So yeah. you look at it's still it went in the LSU game. It went and dropped mm-hmm. from. Two and a half to two, back up to two and a half. So the, right now, Texas is an underdog in two games, and it's right about. Oh, so the LSU line changed? It's two, back up hmm. to two and a half from last I saw. Okay. And if you look across the board, like this is where you're battling those road games where at TCU, Texas, about a six point favorite. And then there's, it used to be West Virginia was the team you might be afraid of, but yeah, without Holgerson, a really not in early I in the season. So then it's late in the year when you look at Baylor and Iowa State in back to back weeks. Yeah. It can be both on the road and trap situations not even trap because they're both good teams that good also coaches. have personal incentive like yeah. texas is a super bowl to those schools so you add in say out of those road games a uh, coin flip but you probably if you're talking about your underdog in two and then two really tough road games late in the year against teams that yeah. are physical teams inside your conference it's going to be hard to be able to say win half of those games now. That's why in Vegas right now it's looking like the sharper money is on nine wins to go nine under and nine and a half okay. instead yeah. of going ten. But that ten's enticing because yeah, if I you look you. at it, I mean, I really think Texas can beat Oklahoma this year and, and luckily get uh, LSU at home. So if you're talking about just performing against lesser teams on the road, it's some situation that actually, you know, Herman hasn't been horrible at, but – to pick Texas to win two or three of those makes it a lot tougher. I so agree. it's like ten and two and nine and three is that battle that you're having. Thinking about thinking about it from this standpoint too, in terms of individual achievements and accomplishments, a two loss Texas team that beats Oklahoma twice and wins the Big Twelve. Sam Ellinger is in New York at that point, is he not? Uh, yeah. you're almost you're in a college football playoff. Yeah. I would, yeah, that's a good point. Maybe you are in the college football. Oh, you beat you, Oklahoma twice. If you be or beat LSU and then beat Oklahoma. Either way, you, if, if you win the Big three, 12. And you're a, two, you and you're a two loss team. Championship yeah. Against those teams and you have wins. Depends on when you lose, though. Oh, yeah. If you have lost. You know, you can't and, and lose. And if you lose one of those, you like, can't TC. lose Baylor, Iowa State back to back. Yeah. Backdoor your way in. And you'd and have then to win. win. You had to beat Oklahoma in the Big 12. And like you said, you can't, you can't lose late. So basically, last month of the season, you'd have to go undefeated, including the Big 12 title. So you're only, if those. You do have losses. They'd have to come. If you lose, I think LSU you could lose and, two games. You could lose to LSU and still make it yeah. to the college football playoff. And yeah. Oklahoma. In theory, you could lose those first two, run yeah, the table, and win the Big 12. I think the, the pa- I think, Rod, I think the Pac-12 is getting to the playoff this year. Yeah, you got Oregon Whether and it's Washington. Or- Oregon, Washington, Utah. I think one of those yeah. three teams gets in. I like in. Utah, too. Yeah, I, I, like, I like Oregon. I think a one loss. I think oh, I think oh, I could be dead wrong. And no, but Oregon's feel free to run this back if I am. I think Oregon's going to curb stomp Auburn on Saturday. I can believe that, but Auburn's D line, we'll see. It's all yeah, up but to, Oregon's got like three legit NFL yeah, guys on their offensive line. No, it'll be just, it'll, it's actually and one, one of the, the best quarterbacks in the it's country. Worth the rest one of the of best the line, line matchups in the country all year. You'll see, and yeah. it's where the rest of the Pac-12 will ultimately sort of decide how much creditation we give to the Pac-12 champion. And, you know, if you're a undefeated one, you're in. But when we're starting to battle out one yeah, yeah, loss yeah. teams, like the Pac-12 really does and hurt Matt, you if as you're, overall conference. If you're, if you're, if what you're talking about, can a, could a two-loss Big 12 champion, let's assume it's Texas, could they be in the mix for a playoff? I think at that point you're looking at, okay, how strong, if that Pac-12 champion has one loss, how, how strong is that one loss? You look at a program like Notre Dame, like Notre Dame, as easy as their schedule is, in theory, looking at it right now, Rod, I think Notre Dame's got to go undefeated to get into the CFP. I don't think a one-loss Notre Dame team yeah. gets in. Because USC's down. they got some people that are down on their schedule. Right. you got They're Clemson, like, Bama, yeah. you got the Big Ten champion, and then you have the battle. And, and, but then what happens if something like if Georgia and Alabama are both undefeated going to the SEC championship game, 
Like, mm. it is the, I'm, I'm assuming the loser of that game is still one of the best four teams in the country. Yeah, it all depends on the resume of the Big 12 champion and the yeah. Pac-12 champion. Yeah. yeah, like you said, then it'll be just a side between three. But then and then you're starting to go down to common opponents. Like, if Texas yeah. loses to LSU, but Georgia and Alabama both have wins over LSU. Like, that's the kind of... That's the kind of stuff you get into it could get in a match scenario where you but say you know what? what chances is a two-loss It wouldn't Texas surprise have. me because I've always said I, I've said this Texas team kind of reminds me of when I first started doing sports radio in 08. And I and all the talk and a lot of the – it reminds me of that group in a lot of ways, a ton of ways. Even, I, I wrote mm-hmm. that story yesterday. Right, yeah, saying, even yeah. like the, you know, the uncertainty about how good – if the defense was going to be any good and, you know, the transcendent – uh, like off season of Sam Ellinger, people mm-hmm. talking more about the intangibles, not about physically how to. To your people, point, people just, are talking about Cole McCoy, like this dude's a leader, man. He's yeah. unbelievable. And you're like, damn, what is he doing? Just yeah. how, just how people can look at numbers, numbers, and, yeah. and, and kind of skew them, and you really got to study them. Uh, Texas only brought back like, four defensive starters from that 2007 defense that still, still to this day, is the worst defense in school history in terms of opponent completion percentage allowed in a season and pass defense in a season. That was yeah. a horrible 2007 defense. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. one of the one of those stories you lost, you lost an All-American defensive tackle with Frank Ocam, right? We talk about mm-hmm. the central nervous system of the yeah. defense. You were starting two freshman, freshman safeties. safeties. Yeah. You know, you kick Lamar Hughes, you Very kick similar. Lamar Houston down that experiment, kick him inside, mm-hmm. you know, from in yeah. to tackle. A lot of uncertainty. Yeah. And and then in a first what? year defensive coordinator. You yeah, know how well my champ exactly. was. And then do. by the end of the Texas OU game in a month, you were like, Man, we're the best team in the nation. Like and then that it, quickly can transform. And then it ended up you barely missed the uh, the BCS because and it shows you didn't <laughs> win late yep. in yeah. the season. Yeah. You have to win late in the season. Yeah. And late in the season saying, is what's rude, Texas. Yeah. That's the main thing with Texas is how you can afford to lose a game early this year to say LSU you or Oklahoma and still survive the yeah. problem is the wrong thing with Texas that year just because of the way the schedule played out you lost late in the season after Oklahoma loss yeah. and that's just going to be fresher on the voters minds because that's how it always has sort of worked out it's human nature to be that way and you're talking about that parallel from that 07 to 08 it's crazy too because like you said the transformation and everybody Colt McCoy was this leader that a year ago wasn't even known if he was going to be your quarterback and that's where yeah, we were with Sam point. Ellinger too and the way that he was treated Treated in camp, and it was the same way that even beforehand you had always had the Sneed and McCoy situation to even Childs, and then it ended up, nope, it's Colton, and it's go, Colt, Colt, go. Yeah. So a couple minutes left on the show this week. Let's talk about Louisiana Tech. Rod, yeah, let's do it. I asked Tom Herman in the Monday press conference about preparing when you look at the Texas offense against the La Tech defense, and you got a first-year coordinator in Bob Diaco who hasn't called defensive signals since 2017, and that was one year at Nebraska. In Nebraska, and to find been, him as a coordinator, you got to go back to his time at Notre Dame. Before was he a co DC there? Or did he, was he calling the plays? I, cause I can't, at Nebraska, uh, and no, at, at Notre Dame, was he like a? No, he was the DC by he himself. He was the yeah. one calling the plays. Okay. Yeah, all right. That Thanks. year where they had Manti Teo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. That was that was Bob Diaco. I think he won the Broyles Award that year, if I remember mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I asked Tom Herman. I said, well, when you when you've got an opener and a first year defensive coordinator. Like, what do you look at? Like, how far back do you go? And he said, really, you look at a little bit of everything. They're looking at even some Oklahoma stuff from last year. They're looking at UConn stuff, Nebraska stuff. I don't know if you go look at Notre Dame stuff. got Larry Fedora working overtime. But he said basically (laughs) basically that's kind of on Todd Orlando to look at – or not Todd Orlando, but look at Tim Beck and and schematically kind of what they might do. That's Tim Beck and and Tom Herman are going to do that. Just in terms of okay, schematically, coverage-wise, what might uh, that look like? But it's on the position coaches to go over personnel and say this is what their linebackers look like. If you're Herb Hand, hey, this is what their D line look like. And, and Louisiana Tech's reloading, you know, their D line. They lose Jalen Ferguson. Lose everybody gotta, off their D line. Reload their entire defensive line. But their back seven is the back seven ain't bad. Uh, Amik, Ro- Amik nice. Robertson's a guy that's going to have a chance to play in the NFL. Yeah, I, I yeah, I like their matter of fact. I think all of their their two. Return their two starting safeties return and their two starting corners return. Yeah, and Sneed, I think, was a guy they moved from corner to safety. I yeah, think he made in the made spring. That they said he's the transition's been smooth, and you know, I love guys that do that because that means my safety can cover. I think Sneed, you know Sneed, I mean? Sneed I can, and I can Robertson put him at safety and just leave him out there as a guy that can cover as a safety if I need to. Yeah, Sneed and Robertson, both those guys are going to have a chance, I think, to play in the NFL. Um, but Rod, with the issues we talked about at running back, to me, this is a game where if you're Herb Hand in that Texas offensive line, you can come out and make a statement and, and make life easy on Sam Ellinger, make like you know, make life easy on those two running backs and an inexperienced Louisiana Tech defensive line, and just go out and just mash people from the get go. Yeah, I agree with that. You should be able to dominate up front. That's their biggest weakness. 
you don't want to get in a situation, you know, and they, I think last year one thing they did really well was forcing teams into third and long. When they got into a third and long situation, I believe they would force opponents to an average of seven, third and seven or seven-plus yards to go, which is really good. And, you know, if you're Texas, you want to avoid those situations. You want to avoid third and long so you don't have to throw against this secondary. They actually do have a couple of guys that can rush the passer. Um, so you don't want to get in a situation where they can pin their ears back and you're predictable or throwing up against that secondary because I think that's the strength of the team, not just the defense. That's the strength of the whole team. Yeah, yeah. to add to your point, uh, the third down distance average was 8.2 against them last year, which is 15th in the nation. So they oh, were wow. That was way better. Not, okay, yeah. And I, ended up being a third and long success rate was 20% of the time, so they are top 29. So not only did they make them go a lot, but then they were top – 30 in the nation and actually preventing them from getting that conversion. So Matt, I hate that's to, what they're good at. So I hate to put you, you want to avoid. I hate to put you on the spot, but uh, lo- looking at LaTeX numbers, what were they in takeaways last year? Oh, uh, well, turnover rate. Right? Hmm. Let me flip over to one other side, but they're pretty decent it looks like. Let me go down. Yeah. The last year they weren't I mean, they I, they were they were the defense that was. I think they finished the year turnover margin something like plus three or something yeah. like that. No, they they made some plays on defense. You go back and watch. They got. I think their. I think their back seven is actually really really talented. Yeah, like I said, Amik Robertson and Lejarius Sneed are two guys that yeah. you know, could play played a lot of places. So um, I, I, so yeah, if you're, it, it'll be a challenge in a sense for for Texas is because I know Texas doesn't. You know they don't want to be, you know, predictable and you want to be multidimensional. Um, but I'm with you. They should be able to push this defensive line around. Yeah. If they can't, that may be a sign of bigger issues. This offensive right. line is not as good as we thought. Right. Uh, and to that point, Rod, Tom Herman said even, you know, the Bob Diaco situation at Clouds where he said they might not have, you know, as many calls or as many things available as they would in a normal opener when you really don't know exactly what you're going to see, you might just kind of limit yourself a little bit. So this I can goes, see that. This goes back to maybe that gamesmanship. Maybe yeah. now that, that forces them to hold some things back that they otherwise would be tempted to put on tape for LSU. Yeah, because it could, it could, you know, you don't know what Bob Diaco's you know, going to present, so he could expose some things that you don't really mean for him to expose. You know what I mean? I think ultimately this is what Texas is going to do. They're going to rely on two things. They're going to rely on their power running game because they should be a theoretically to be able to move those guys and push the pile and reset the line of scrimmage. Yeah. And after that, deep balls. I think they will take their shots. And taking shots, you can stress the defense, and you don't have to really reveal much. If they end up in one-on-one on a Colin Johnson or a John Bird or a Devin DuVernay, and they'll trust their corners every now and then to be, one, be yeah. one-on-one. They will because they got, they got good secondary that's what guys. They do, yeah. yeah, and they have to because they got to put more guys in the box to stop that Texas running game. And when they do that – Texas takes their shots, and that's what I think Texas is going to try to separate themselves. But it'll be it'll, it'll be a risk, man, because they're going up against really good guys in the secondary. It'll be and a good I, test for them. And I think any time you're talking about an opener, Tom Herman mentioned this also, Rod, penalties and turnovers, you just want to limit those as much as possible. Just try to play as clean of a game as you can. They've done a good job in the scrimmages. Remember, that's what yeah. Tom Herman, I think, has, in the last three scrimmages, he's remarked each time how much – They've uh, improved on taking care of the football. And now it's time to put that into use in a game situation. Looking at the other side of the coin mm. of the Texas defense against the LaTeX offense, Rod, this is the matchup that if I'm nervous about anything as a Texas fan looking at this going into this game, this is where you should probably be a little bit nervous because LaTeX does have an offense with a veteran quarterback with Jamar Smith. You know, Adrian Hardy, Tom Herman said he could probably play just about anywhere in the country. 1,000-yard yard wide receiver. Yeah. And their offensive line from a talent standpoint – uh, you know, I think Texas fans that follow recruiting really closely, uh, you know, they'll see some names on that offensive line uh, that yeah. they'll probably recognize. Yeah, they got a transfer from LSU. Yeah, right? uh, and um, then Dwight Stallworth was a guy that yeah. Texas kind of kicked the tires on as as a JUCO guy. So um, yeah, Willie Allen. Is yeah, his Willie name. Allen was a pretty highly recruited guy. Uh, Tyler JUCO. Of, uh, yeah, but I think he was John Curtis High School in Louisiana. Okay. Then was LSU. Then yeah. JC. He was like the player of the year in one of the JUCO rounds. So. All that said, I think Louisiana Tech's going to be much better along the offensive line. Now, how does that translate relative to you know a good offensive line Texas is going to see in the Big 12? I don't know, but they're going to be better. Uh, they're banking on Jay Moore Smith to take a step forward. You know, Adrian Hardy's the kind of guy that can beat you deep, Rod. And you look, I think there's like four or five of Louisiana Tech's returning wide receivers that last year had a catch of 50 yards or more. Yeah. So you know this is an offense that if you're not careful, if you're lackadaisical, if you don't have things tight on the back end and you're not getting pressure on the quarterback – 
you know they can mm-hmm. take the top off of you and beat you deep. And considering how Maryland gashes defense each of the last two years with explosive plays, especially last year, like if you really take out the four chunk yardage plays, two on the ground, two in the air that Maryland got, they were averaging something like around three, three and a half yards a play. Yeah. If you take those four out, those four plays, it was just, I think three of them were touchdowns and one of them set up another That's score. Sweet. So that really was the difference in the ball game was just your inability to prevent explosive plays. And that goes exactly to what Rod was saying earlier about how this is the type of team that he expects to go and take those risks. And I saw a good study this year done, and it literally was by, by the guy that works with ESPN now, Bill Connor but talking about how you really you had always thought sort of that you could look at every team and then sort of make it be predictable as if uh, explosive plays were predictable and found out that necessarily success rate in staying on chains, moving the ball, and that is something that is correlated to how good your offense is. But you can almost find out that explosive plays and big plays really has no correlation to how good your offense is. Now, you do have a frequency of more, but the main thing to think about it is the risk reward is there for those lesser teams to do it yeah. even more frequently yeah. because of the payoffs there and the numbers even bear it out that no, you should be just as fearful against these teams of those type of plays because that's the only way that they have to beat you. And if a coach understands oh, yeah. that, he'll take advantage of. We it. forgot, man. Tulsa had some big explosive plays on Texas in that oh, fourth yeah. quarter. Yeah. That fourth quarter had like three, four deep balls they threw on Texas. Luke Skipper going. Yeah, deep. exactly. And, <laughs> and honestly, and what happened in that game? Right, Texas is up by three touchdowns and. Then yep. honestly, oh, ends Big up being play, a one score game. A turnover. Yeah, yeah, it's all you need. So yeah, I think you do got if if you're I mean, if you're Louisiana Tech, you got nothing to lose. No. You know what I mean? So they're coming yeah. in with that mentality. That's always dangerous. So as and, we get as we get to prediction time, uh twenty in the Texas is a twenty and a half point favorite to the start of the week. Matt, that as of right now that hasn't moved. Nope, hasn't moved. As far moved. as you can tell. Okay. Twenty and a half. Twenty and a half. Uh, Ooh, that's for, a big number. For those rod, as you say, the FIPO line, if you need that, uh, I believe fifty five, Matt, fifty five and a half, depending 55 on five across the board, except one book has a fifty five and a half. There so. you go. So that's right where, at about a thirty eight seventeen mm, game is okay, for yeah, your FIPO out. line for entertainment purposes. Purposes only. Okay. Um, right. Rod, as we get in this game, going back to your point that you made just a minute ago about you know Texas needing to kind of step on the throat when they've got a chance, to me that's kind of the theme for this team. You talk about the 08 team. Just because you're inexperienced in some areas doesn't give you an excuse to lack maturity. And I think this team, especially with those five captains, I think it's a mature team. If you're looking for anything as a Texas fan, I think just look and see that. If Texas controls this game with the starters in there, there's no let up. They've got their foot mashed to the floorboard the entire time. Regardless of whether La Tech gets a backdoor cover or something like that, I think you can feel as a Texas fan good about that performance going into the LSU game. Play a clean game. Don't get anybody hurt and make it uh, as uninteresting as quickly as you can. Yep. Really the three objectives for Texas. Um, I'll take Texas to cover, guys, cover that 20 and a half. Barely. Yeah. Uh, I'll go with like a 41-20 Texas win over Louisiana Tech. Okay. I like that. Mm. Okay. You want to go next, I'll go, uh, Since you're I'll go over there. 38 to, oh, man. You know what? I'm going 38-14. So, yeah, I'll go cover, too. Okay. Yeah, and no, I was thinking right along those lines. Oh, yeah. And when you look at Texas, like, say, Herman at Texas on the over-under aspect of things, he's only went over nine times, under 18 times. Even at Houston, mm. had went over less than he's went under. It was, like, I believe five and eight and five and seven. You look at Louisiana Tech, they're the same case the last two years, 10 over, 16 under. So both sort of trend that way. The thing that scares me is the amount of plays that both teams won to fit in can make it go over pretty quickly so it all just sort of comes down to how good the texas defense is and i think that since you already know louisiana tech had a good or respectable defense last season and then they may be improved on offense which may mean that they can actually hold on to the ball a little bit more it makes it trend towards a more defensive game so i think it might barely shade under but i think texas definitely be able to cover and win but maybe just not as many points as you think which maybe isn't as big of an issue but fans may think because if you don't get around that 35 40 point threshold or then fans start freaking out but yeah i think it'll be something like a 35 to 13 game somewhere along those lines and and file this away too just how formidable of an opponent and a program la tech is as a group of five school their last 11 games against Power 5 teams, Rod, 1-10, and 10, but 7-4 and four against the spread mm. with that one outright win and 
They did cover in Baton Rouge last year. Yeah, they were in that game until they played the a good quarter. game against LSU. Yeah. yeah, Hardy, I think, had ten receptions and two touchdowns. The receiver did against LSU. Yeah. Jamar Smith, the quarterback, arguably had his best game versus LSU. Well, yeah. I mean, in theory, yeah. Texas is the type of situation where LaTeX gets up for LSU. Like that's your in state. These are kids you grew Split up around. Point. The thing, though, a lot of these Texas kids are like from Houston, and like these are the same areas, and you've went to the same type Very of true. camps, and are familiar with each other. So the way that they view a school like Texas may be quite similar, even though it's not an in-state rivalry. No, that's a good point. All right, so the three of us are taking Texas to win and cover. And cover, baby. Gentlemen, let's just see if Texas gets through this game with as few issues as possible, <laughs> because next just win, week, baby. Just win, next baby. week, oh, oh, sweet. Eight pound baby Jesus in your golden fleece diapers <laughs> next week. When we get to Be talk the focus about LSU, of the college football world. Yes, Matt. Thanks for everything, man. You're more than welcome, Rod. B. Appreciate the time and the knowledge. Anytime, brother. For Matt, for Rod, for Travis, the best damn videographer in the podcast game. For everybody at the Austin Radio Network and the Horn 1049, 1019 AM twelve sixty streaming on the Horn app and the HornFM.com. Where you can get Longhorn Blitz twice a week, once seven o'clock Tuesday nights, and the other time, the second time, uh, right after Longhorn Weekly with Tom Herman on Thursdays and. You can get Rob B. on the Rodcast each and every weekday from 1 to 3. Shameless plug. You can get this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcasts. Don't forget to like us and leave us a review. And thanks to Matt, you can get all of our archives, classic interviews, classic shows on the Longhorn Blitz SoundCloud page. Yep, just type in Longhorn Blitz. For the Horn family, for the Horns 24-7 family, I'm Jeff Howe. Thank you so much for downloading and listening, and we will catch you again on the next episode. You've been listening to Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Remember, for the latest Longhorn news 24-7, visit Horns247.com.